breaking down half-open doors. In spite of all inhibitions, breaks and self-doubt in the course of its development, enlightenment has unleashed an enormous potential for reflection. This is unmistakable even in the present phase of demoralization. The penetration of science, psychology and schooling into large areas of social life has brought strong means of reflection, especially into the heads of the intelligentsia and state employees. The diffusion of power in the modern state has led to an extraordinary dissemination of the knowledge of power, which simultaneously intensifies the cynicism of the knowledge of power as sketched earlier, that is, the self-denial of morality and the splitting off of insights that cannot be lived out into a diffuse collective mentality. Here we flesh out our initial thesis. Discontent in our culture appears today as universal diffuse cynicism. With the diffusion of cynicism to a collective mentality of intelligence in the gravitational field of the state and the knowledge of power, the erstwhile moral foundations of ideology critique collapse. Critics, as Walter Benjamin notes in his aphorism of 1928, see the preface, have long since blended together with what is to be criticised, and that distance that would be created by morality has been lost through a general muddling along in immorality, semi-morality, and the morality of lesser evils. Cultivated and informed people of today have become aware of the essential model of critique and the procedure of unmasking without having been shaken. The existence of such models of critique is perceived today as a contribution to the sad complicatedness of relations in the world, rather than as an impulse for an existential self-reflection. Who today is still an enlightener? The question is almost too direct to be decent. There is, to be concise, not only a crisis of enlightenment, not only a crisis of the enlighteners, but even a crisis in the praxis of enlightenment, in commitment to enlightenment. Today the word committed is said with a mixture of acknowledgement and indulgence, as if it were a fragile sediment from a younger psychological layer that has to be handled with the utmost care. It is almost as if our sympathy goes less to those for whom another commits himself or herself than to the commitment itself and its rarity and fragile naivete. Who does not know this from his or her feelings towards the so-called alternative movements? Something similar can be seen in France, where the younger generation of intelligentsia, après sat, in experiencing the dissolution of the old foundations of political moralism that constituted leftist identity. Commitment, quoting Ludwig Marcuse, takes place in the ivory tower. The committed sit there actively. In the moral foundation of enlightenment is... In that the moral foundation of enlightenment is decomposing, because the modern state simultaneously demoralizes the enlightened and makes public servants of them, the perspectives of what was earlier called commitment are becoming blurred. When someone tries to agitate me in an enlightened direction, my first reaction is a cynical one. The person concerned should get his or her own shit together. That's the nature of things. Admittedly, one should not injure goodwill without reason, but goodwill could easily be a little more clever and save me the embarrassment of saying, I already know that, for I do not like being asked, well then why don't you do something? Things have been this way for a long time. The committed enlightener breaks down doors that admittedly are not completely open, but they also no longer have to be broken down. It can go so far that one knows more about moral conditions as a cynic than as a committed person. 
Since Erich Kessner, the tone of satire in modern enlightenment is reflectively tinged and hits its mark with a melancholy, coquettish spin, if it still wants to hit the mark at all. Today's jokers are anything but committed, and they can profit from the inflated price of laughter insofar as buffoonery suits the spirit of the times better than does good old nasty satire. The last defenders of ideology critique are inspired buffoons such as Otto, in whom one finds little sociology, but a good deal of mental alertness. Besides, com uh, besides commitment and entwined with it, we find in our memory another recent sediment, the experience of a student movement scarcely settled with its ups and downs of courage and depression. This most recent sediment in the history of political vitality forms an additional veil over the old feeling that something ought to be done about this world. The dissolution of the student movement must interest us because it represents a complex metamorphosis of hope into realism, of revolt into a clever melancholy, from a grand, grand political denial into a thousand-faceted small sub-political affirmation, from a radicalism in politics into a middle course of intelligent survival. I do not really believe in the end of enlightenment, merely because the spectacle has come to an end. When so many disappointed enlighteners whine today, they are spitting out all their rage and sadness, which would hinder them from continuing to propagate enlightenment into the spittoon of the public sphere. Only courageous people feel when they are discouraged. Only enlighteners notice when it is getting dark. Only moralists can become demoralized. In a word, we are still here. Leonard Cohen has written a lyrical line that could be the battle song of an enlightenment that has become muted. Quoting Chelsea Hotel Number 2, Well, never mind, we are ugly, but we have the music. A German Enlightenment intelligentsia does not find itself for the first time in such a twilight state, where the doors are ajar, the secrets aired, and the masks half lowered, and where, in spite of this, dissatisfaction still will not be dispelled. In the introduction to part 5, I want to describe the Weimar symptom as the temporally closest historical mirror in which we can look at ourselves. In the Weimar Republic, the progressive intelligentsia had already reached a stage of reflection in which ideology critique as a social game became possible, and in which everyone could lift the masks from everyone else's face. From this stage of development comes the experience of total suspicion of ideology, which was discussed so much after the Second World War, and which has spoken about so much because one would have really liked to have avoided the serious game of this critique. If one slips into the umpire's black suit for a moment, one finds a clearly structured playing field with well-known players established tactics and typical fouls. Each side has developed certain almost rigged moves of critique. The religious criticise the a-religious and vice versa, whereby each side has in its repertoire a meta-critique of the ideology critique used by the opposing side. The moves in the dialogue between Marxists and liberals are to a large extent fixed. Likewise, those between Marxists and anarchists, as well as those between anarchists and liberals. In this dialogue, the approximate penalty for the anarchists' fouls and the customary depression of the liberals and the Marxists after the length of the sentence is announced are known. One knows pretty well what natural scientists and representatives of the humanities will accuse each other of. Even the ideology critique used by militarists and pacifists of the other threatens to stagnate, at least as far as creative moves are concerned. For ideology critique, the Sartian film title, 
the game is over, itself almost half a century old, thus seems apposite.